where I only know very few things, and I forget more than I know, uh, but yet God knows all. And this morning, I am so limited in my abilities and my power of what I can accomplish on a day-to-day -day basis, and even in the span of a lifetime, but yet God is all-powerful. Uh, and the wonder of the gospel is that though there is this immense eternal degree between God and man, that gap is bridged in the person, Jesus Christ, the God-man. He brings us to God. Uh, what a wonder our Savior is. Amen? So we want to look at some definitions uh, just to make sure we're on the same page when we talk about omnipotent or omnipotence. Uh, omnipotence is, uh, Gerhardus Voss describes it, or defines it as the capacity to accomplish what is not in conflict with God's own being. I believe you have on your notes there uh, a definition from Louis Burkhoff. He defines uh, omnipotence as the power of God to execute his will. The power of God to execute his will. Stephen Sharnock gives a, a little more lengthy definition uh, he defines the omnipotence of God as his ability and strength to bring to pass whatsoever he pleases. So that whatsoever he pleases is his will in the definition of Louis Burkhoff. I think you have on your notes there, Charles Ryrie, a, a good helpful definition of omnipotence is that God is all-powerful and able to do anything consistent with his own nature. And we're going to be looking at that last little part of that sentence, consistent with his own nature. Because he can do anything in one sense, but yet in another sense, there are things that he simply cannot do. But it's not a limitation to his power. It, it is, it is uh, the expression of his holiness and his perfection, which makes him unable to do things that are inconsistent with his own nature. We'll look at that in a bit. So first of all, on your notes, number one, the evidence of omnipotence. The evidence of omnipotence. We see the omnipotence of God uh, throughout the pages of Scripture. Uh, we're going to be turning together to uh, a handful of the text, not every single text, uh, but we'll turn to enough, I think, where we'll... We'll get the point, and I'll, and I'll quote the rest for you as we go along, all right? Uh, first of all, in Scripture, uh, one clear way that we see the, the uh, omnipotence of God is in his name. Not in the name Yahweh, but he has another, uh, another name, uh, God Almighty. God Almighty is the name in Hebrew, which translates uh, the Hebrew El Shaddai. El Shaddai. El, in the word, or in the name El Shaddai, El speaks of God, of course. Uh, Elohim speaks of uh, God. Uh, it's the fuller form. El is a short form of Elohim, the, the name for God. Shaddai means almighty. So El Shaddai is God Almighty. Uh, this name obviously uh, refers to his awesome strength and might. Uh, let's turn to Genesis 17.1. It's always good to, let's just get in the word, right? Let God speak for himself. Genesis Chapter 17. Can somebody please read for us uh, verse 1, nice and loud. Now when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. Amen. 
Thank you, brother. So he says he is God Almighty. And this is actually the name that he gives himself as he reveals himself and makes a covenant with Abram, uh, who becomes Abraham, uh, with Isaac and with Jacob and the rest of Genesis. He reveals himself as God Almighty, especially as he uh, introduces and reconstitutes uh, his, his uh, uh, covenant to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, each generation. What's interesting is that in Exodus, when he reveals himself in the burning bush to Moses, uh, what's the name that he gives himself there? I am. I am. But in giving himself that name, that covenant name, he says, I used to reveal myself, or I used to be known to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as God Almighty. But now I am known to you as Yahweh, I am. Uh, so in Genesis, what is being communicated through the whole book of Genesis uh, is God Almighty. We see the mighty works of God as each chapter unfolds. That's how he's revealed. And then as Exodus unfolds, we see this covenant relationship of I am, Yahweh, with his people. But it, nonetheless, in, in Genesis, uh, he is El Shaddai. God Almighty. Psalm 91 verse 1 says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. El Shaddai. So Christian, just as the psalmist says, every believer dwells in God. We find our shelter in God. Christ says, I abide in you and you abide in me, right? And so in Christ, we abide in the shadow of God Almighty. And what great comfort comes with that, right? What great solace uh, when, uh, whether it's the news, the headlines, or it's just life, diagnosis, whatever it might be, uh, troubles, inflation, fill in the blank, right? Whatever comes, we have an almighty God in whom we dwell and we find refuge. Another evidence of the omnipotence of God is that there is nothing that he cannot do. V on your notes. There is nothing that he cannot do. And I would put in parentheses, that is good and right, or that is consistent with his nature. But we'll get to, we'll, we'll, we'll fill in that detail in a bit, as I mentioned. Uh, turn to Job 9.12. Let's go to Job. Chapter 9, verse 12. As you're turning there, Jeremiah 32, 17 says, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. Nothing is too difficult for God. And then the same uh, teaching is given by Job. Somebody please read Job 9, 12. You see, when God does something, there is no reversal of it. There is, there is no opposing force that is a threat to the power of God. No one can say, when, when God accomplishes his will, no one can question his work. You see, he is unrivaled. His power has no equal. And so, therefore, he is free to do whatever he wants to do because nobody can hold him back. He has no rival. Not only this, but I think the, the 
clearest and the uh, the best way to understand the omnipotence of God is see here on your notes that what God wants, he does. What God wants, he does. We'll look at both of these texts. Uh, Psalm 115. Psalm 115. Verse 3. Somebody please read that for us. What an amazing, succinct, yet packed, theologically packed sentence. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. So the psalmist here places God, acknowledges God as being in the heavens, that is high and lifted up, above, exalted, above all others. Uh, in a class all his own. And notice that he says, but our God. And this is in response to the, uh, to the mocking of the world, to the, to, the, to the derision of the unbeliever. Verse 1, not to us, O Yahweh, not to us, but to your name give glory because of your loving kindness, because of your truth. Why should the nations say, where now is their God? Isn't that what the world says? Isn't that what the unbeliever says? Where, where is God in all this? Where is God? I mean, look at the, the news, right? Look at coronavirus. Look at uh, 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 the Middle East. Look at Afghanistan. Look at uh, Ukraine. Uh, Look at the, the politics and the policies of America and, and the society that we are just in. It just seems like everything is falling apart. And so the unbeliever says, where is God? Uh, if God is good and all-powerful, how do we have what we have today, right? Our response is, our God is in the heavens, and he does whatever he pleases. So what you see in the world is God accomplishing his plan. And it may not please us. The, the small headlines of each day may not please us or the trials of our, of our life or the, the difficulty of a season that we find ourselves in may not please us for the moment. But God is... Looking at the big plan, right? He is accomplishing something much greater than us, much greater than our small trials. Through all of it, he is accomplishing, he is doing his pleasure. So what is happening in the world is accomplishing what he wants to accomplish. Let's turn to Isaiah 46. And again, if, if there's any questions or thoughts, comments, uh, this isn't a sermon, so uh, we welcome that in the interaction that we, we might want to have. That's, that's welcome, as long as I can catch it in time. Um, what God wants, he does. What he desires, he realizes. What he plans, he accomplishes. What he wills, he causes. All different ways of saying the same thing. What God wills, he causes. He is the cause. Isaiah 46, verse 9 and 10 says, But these two things will come... No, nope, wrong one. Uh, remember the former things long past, verse 9. Remember the former things long past. For I am God... And there is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me. How are how are you? How is there no one like you, God? He's, he's going to tell you. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, things which have not been done, 
saying, My counsel will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Wow, what a, what a claim about oneself. This is what God says about himself. Uh, well, let, let's just slow this down, right? Uh, verse 10. God is holy. There's no one like him in that he declares the end from the beginning. Right? This is where the idea of Alpha and Omega comes from. The beginning and the end. He is all-encompassing and he declares the end from the beginning. I think we've talked about this before, where uh, it, it is as if God, we, we turn to Genesis 1, 1, where it says, God in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it's as if there were a chapter before that, as if, right, in eternity past, from the beginning, God declares what the end would be the new heavens and the new earth, eternity with God, and everything in between. That's the idea. So from the very beginning, from day one, God, God declared and decided what would transpire throughout all history and where everything would end up at the end. From the beginning, he declared the end. That's what he's saying. I... An illustration of this is Babe Ruth, right? Uh, the, the famous uh, baseball player who his, in his iconic uh, moment of his career, uh, he, he was known for uh, hitting home runs all the time, but there was one home run that stood above the rest where he stood at home base at, at the plate and he pointed to the rafters, Right? And he says, I'm hitting it out of the park. And it's going to be over there. And you can imagine, who does this guy think he is, right? If you were there, who does this man think he is declaring what he's going to do before the pitch? He doesn't even know what pitch is coming. And yet, pitch comes, Babe Ruth swings, and it goes right where he said. Home run, Right? And he's known for that. He, that's what makes him famous. That's, his, that's the glory of Babe Ruth. That's the fame of him. Uh, that is but a shadow, dear Christian, of the power of God. From the beginning, declaring what would happen. Calling his shots before it was ever made, you could say. That's your God. And so, no, he's not surprised by what's come your way. He's not surprised by anything. Uh, we were surprised, maybe some of us, of the news that came out of the Supreme Court this past week. He wasn't surprised. It's all part of his plan. He's just accomplishing what he's declared from the beginning. And not only this, from ancient times, things which have not been done. So, same thing, same verb is to be inputted there declaring from ancient times things which have not been done. So before things happened, before uh, there, was, there were humans to, to do things, he, he says, declared from ancient times what, what, what humanity would do. And it's not that we are robots, but it is that God is sovereign. And notice where all this comes from. It, it, it is not so much that God is just a really good fortune teller. It's not so much that God just knows the future of what will happen. We're talking about omnipotence here. It's not so much that God is really good uh, and he's just so wise that, you know, there's all these possibilities and he knows all the possibilities and so therefore he's able to Figure out what will transpire. That's what it means, you know, declaring the end from the beginning. No, that's not what it is. He explains what he means by this. Saying, my purpose, uh, my purpose, or my counsel, 
will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. The fact that he declares the end from the beginning is not that he is really good about figuring out what will happen, not that he's really smart to figure it out, not that he's a good fortune teller, or that he is outside of time, though, though that is true of him. Uh, it is that the way that he can declare what will happen is because he chose what would happen. And he planned what would happen and then accomplished it. That is how he is able to declare what will happen. It's because what is happening in time is God accomplishing the plan. The plan, singular. God is accomplishing what he has decreed from the beginning. God's omnipotence is his ability to bring about whatever he pleases. He, we, on the other hand, desire things, right? But we cannot bring them to pass, right? I, I would, uh, somebody working in, in a job would, would desire to get a promotion, but they can't cause that to happen. They can work hard and, and, and you know, try and put in his resume and, uh, and, and ask for the promotion, but you can't cause it. But when God desires something, when he wants something to happen, it's done. We, Christian, uh, you need to understand, we cannot manifest our destiny. Right? That's what God is saying he does. We cannot do that. We're not God. And we're not little gods. We cannot uh, manifest our destiny. We cannot call the shot before it's made and have any part in, in creating the result. Only God does that. And it is blasphemy to say that we can do what only God can do. This is practical, isn't it? Uh, second point this morning. Number two. The extent of omnipotence. The extent of omnipotence. Let's turn to... Uh, let's go to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 32, 27. God's power, God's power goes beyond, it goes beyond what? It goes beyond that which is actually realized. Now, now we're getting into the, now we're, 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 our brains will begin to hurt. It's good though, I enjoy it. God's power goes beyond that which is actually realized or carried out or accomplished by him. Uh, Genesis 18, 14, you have there, it says, is anything too difficult for the Lord? Uh, Jeremiah 32, 27. Somebody please read that for us. See, he's asking. I, and I think he would ask you, Christian, dear, dear child of God, he, he's asking you, really, is there anything too difficult for me? That thing that you've been praying for? Or the salvation of your loved ones? Uh, relief from pain? Physical or spiritual? Uh, Strength for the trial. God would ask you, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too difficult for me? Is there anything that you hold back in your prayers and say, Well, you know, God's not going to do that. Well, how do you know? Well, he, might, he may not give you a, a new Ferrari, right? Right? 
But we're talking about his, according to his will, right? According to the mission that we are on in this world. Is there anything that he can't do for you and for his namesake? And the answer is, 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 uh, it's a redundant question. The answer is, of course not, right? Is anything too difficult for me, God asks? Well, of course not, God. You're, you're God Almighty. That would be our response. So no, there is nothing that he cannot do. So that means, think about that. There are, let's say, this class of things, this list of actions and things throughout history that have been done and that God has planned and carried out. The accomplishments of God, right? Throughout the pages of history. God says, I have done all those things. But what about all the things that he has not done in history? Can he do those? Yes. That's, that's the idea. Let, let's uh, use Jesus' own words, Matthew 3. Turn with me to Matthew. Yeah, Matthew chapter 3. We are venturing into the unknown, into the, I don't want to say theoretical because the scripture speaks of it, but for the lack of a better term, we're, we're, we're venturing into the theoretical or the philosophical or the, uh, into the depths really of God. Matthew 3, 9, somebody please read that for us. I do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that, he, that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. So he's uh, preaching here. Uh, John the Baptist. And um, he's rebuking the, the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're claiming that they have some special right to a relationship with God, some special right to God's favor and uh, the eternal inheritance, the eternal life, uh, just based on their nationality. Uh, and uh, John the Baptist rebukes them and says, look, don't just fall back on, we have Abraham as our father, as the reason why God should accept you and the reason why God has favor on you. Uh, he's basically saying God doesn't need you. God does not need you. He says, here's why. From these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. God can turn stones into people and make them children of Abraham. And we learn from Galatians, that's children of faith. God can make followers and worshipers of himself. Didn't Jesus say these stones will cry out, right? God will make worshipers and followers of him out of stones. Now, did he ever do that? No, right? We don't have any record of God taking a stone or Christ taking a stone and transforming it into uh, a full-fledged believer in God and follower and worshiper of God. We don't have that. But he's able to, right? Right? And he means that. He is able to. There is nothing that God cannot do. Uh, Matthew 26, 53, Jesus says the same thing. Uh, as he is being mocked and in the middle of his uh, passion uh, on his way to the cross, he uh, wants to let people know who's really in charge in the midst of all this, because it doesn't look like he is, but Matthew 6, 26, 53, he says, do you not think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Don't you think God can do that? Don't you think my father can do that? You're not in control. But did that happen? No. 
And we praise God. That though he could have, though the Son of God could have had relief and shown everybody who was really in charge, and that would have been a glorious, a magnificent thing to happen, but because of his love for you, Christian, because he came to die on the cross for you and to be buried and to rise again, and for his namesake in the, in the, in the gospel of Christ, because of these things, he did not call uh, 12 legions of angels to his rescue. But he could have. So there are things that God has not done that he could have done. There are things that God will not do, but that he could do. Not evil, but there are great magnificent displays of the supernatural power of God that he could do, but that he doesn't. Uh, MacArthur says, when God exercises his power, he does so effortlessly. It is no more difficult for him to create a universe than to make a butterfly. So he is not stretched in his, in his power, his omnipotence. Not only this, but uh, think about this. We, we will often refer to creation, right? We go camping or something, and we look at creation. Uh, even that's fallen, though. Uh, but we look at that, and we refer to creation and just the great, magnificent, omnipotent power that must have been used to cause everything that we see in the wilderness. And even as we look into the heavens, we see the immense power that God must have expelled to create the heavens and the universe. And yes, it was great power. But think about this, Christian. God is able to do and accomplish more than what we see in creation. So the universe and all creation is not the extent of his power. He made it. He made it out of his power, but, his, but because he is omnipowerful, because he is all-powerful, his, his power stretches and breaks the barrier of creation. It is almost as if he had to limit his power and concentrate his power into accomplish what we see in creation, immense as it is. His power goes beyond that. He could have made something greater, maybe, or something uh, different that explained his glory in another way. Um, that it hurts my brain. The great and powerful act of God in creation required but a thimbleful of the omnipotent power of God. And yet, though God can do anything, there is a sense where he cannot do anything. Uh, I want to go through these quickly because I want to get to the third point. First of all, uh, uh, God cannot lie. God's power does not mean that he can do anything that contradicts his holy character. That's the main point over this. Be on your notes. Under that, God cannot lie. When Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of a man that he should repent. Has he said, will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? Hebrews 6.18 says that uh, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set for us. Speaking of the, the, the surety and the confidence and the security of our salvation in Christ, God has committed himself to us and he cannot lie. Oh, Christian, that is great comfort for your salvation and the security of your salvation in Christ. Remember, a covenant. If you're a believer, you are part of the new covenant. 
Covenant is a contract, a promise. And God, one thing, though he is omnipotent, one thing he cannot do is lie. And so that promise to you in the new covenant is true. One, another thing that he cannot do is he cannot change. 1 Samuel 15, 29 says, uh, The glory of Israel will not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. So he cannot change in the sense of his mind or his plans. James 1, 17 says that every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. He cannot change. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he cannot change. He is immutable. But we're actually going to look at that uh, in one of uh, our lessons in this series. He is immutable. Uh, another thing that he cannot do, he cannot deny himself. 2 Timothy 2.13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. What does that mean, he cannot deny himself? He cannot contradict his holy nature and character. He cannot contradict his holy nature and character. In this verse, 2 Timothy 13, it says, we, in our nature, because we're fallen, we are all over the place. We could, we could be faithful one day and faithless the next. And unreliable. And unbelieving even. Uh, uh, not in the final sense, but doubting. Uh, but God, in his nature, in his character, he is faithful. And so because he cannot deny himself, he cannot become unfaithful. Ever. Ever. It is impossible. And another thing that he cannot do, he cannot sin. He cannot sin. James 1.13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil and he does not tempt anyone. They're speaking of the uh, evil sense of temptation as in trying to get you to sin. God gives you trials and he allows, he allows temptation and he, and he causes trial. But he is not in his sovereign causing of your trial. He is not trying to get you to sin. That's not what he's doing. That's what it says here. And why is that so? Well, because of who he is. He cannot sin. He cannot be tempted by evil. Not only can he not sin, but he can't even be tempted. Right? Because there's nothing within him. That is drawn towards evil. We have our sinful flesh that, we're, that is being drawn out by temptation. So since God is perfectly holy and good, he cannot do anything evil. He cannot do anything wrong. Um, yeah, we need to go on. Point three in your notes. Point three in your notes. The exercise of omnipotence. Uh, any, any questions or thoughts before we go on? Because I know that second point was like going into the depths, right? Uh, kind of just going a little deeper for, for a bit. And that's good for us. But that might cause questions. Any questions or thoughts? All right, uh, the exercise of, of omnipotence. We're coming up a little bit for for air now. Uh, just practically, how do we see the omnipotence of God just around us? Okay, God is omnipotent. He is all powerful. But what does that mean for me and my day to day life? And how do I see that? Well, you first see it in creation. In creation. Uh, Romans 1.20 is a good one. Let's turn there. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. And uh, maybe somebody can read that for us this morning. For since 
the creation of the world is invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived, being understood by what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Thank you, brother. This eternal power is seen in creation. The eternal power of God, another way of speaking of the omnipotence of God, is seen in creation. And it's clearly seen that God is all-powerful because God has caused things to be that man simply cannot create or cause to be. Man cannot make oceans and mountains or atoms. So we see the exercise of the omnipotent power in creation. Isaiah 44, 24 says, uh, Thus says the Lord and your Redeemer, the one who formed you from the womb, I, the Lord, am the maker of all things, stretching out the heavens by myself and spreading out the earth all alone. That's good. He made all things, and he didn't need help. <laughs> he made all things, and he didn't need help. Stretching out the heavens by myself, spreading out the earth all alone. I didn't need somebody to spot me. <laughs> I didn't need somebody to give me a hand over here, right? No, we need that, right? Right. Uh, we're limited. There's certain things where it's like, man, uh, I, we're, we're moving or something. I got to move a couch or a table. I can't do that on my own. I need to call a, a, a buddy and, and have him help me uh, carry this huge couch or table, right? That's a table. <laughs> God made the earth and the heavens on his own. Uh, Psalm 33, 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. He just had to speak, and they were. It's not as if God had a roll of his sleeves. He just spoke, and there was. Just read Genesis 1. God said, and it was. And it's ex nihilo. It's out of nothing. There was. And... So that means nothingness obeyed God, as it were. He did not take something that was so small and, and then cause there to be uh, 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 the universe. He did not uh, take matter and then transform it into the universe that we now see. No, he, there was nothing and then there was something. And the only thing in between those two things was the command of God. So we see the exercise of omnipotence in creation. We see it in providence as well. Providence, be on your notes. This is, this is good stuff. Um, turn with me to Ephesians, because this is really where this drives home for us. Ephesians 1. But as we're turning there, uh, I just want to speak a few things on these other verses. Hebrews 1.3 says that he is the radiance of his glory, that is, Christ is the radiance of the glory of, of the Father, the exact representation of his nature. And he, he upholds all things by the word of his power. So Christ, because he is God, he upholds all things by the word of his power. Colossians 1.17 says the same thing. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So all of creation holds together in Christ, in the power of Christ, and he sustains, he is a sustainer of creation. So, Christian, that means that, uh, you know, when scientists speak about the laws of nature, remember back in school? Uh, the laws of nature. What are some laws of nature? Gravity. Gravity. 
Yes. What goes up must come down, right? That's just a law. <laughs> uh, no matter how hard we try to defy that, and no matter how much it seems like uh, an insect or uh, a, a bird or a plane might defy the law of gravity, they're not. It's taking energy to stay there in the air. They're not canceling the, this law for themselves and just floating. Supernatural. That's not what's happening. There are laws of gravity, or laws of nature like gravity. And scientists, and we speak of these things as laws, right? They are fixed knowns. So much so that scientists create formulas, mathematical formulas, to calculate gravity. It's so predictable that we can calculate gravity and how long something would take to fall to the earth or how fast it would accelerate to. I mean, people way smarter than me can figure that out, right? But they use formulas and, and, and uh, uh, equations to come up with the answer to those questions. How are they able to develop these formulas and these equations? Because these are laws. These are fixed known quantities. At least on earth, right? Uh, these laws of nature uh, have their certainty, their predictableness in the omnipotence of God. We can speak of laws of nature because God is all powerful and holding all things together with his almighty power and he is sustaining it and containing creation so that it's predictable for us and there's all kinds of stats right the earth is on an axis right it's on a tilt uh, and if it wasn't on a tilt then there would be chaos in nature but uh, it is just at the right angle, uh, orbiting around the sun. Uh, and the, the, the moon is just the right size, at the right distance away from the earth, so that uh, the gravity is what it is, uh, and that we can survive on this earth with that law of gravity uh, and not be hurled into space uh, unexpectedly. Uh, and, and the sun is only so hot as it is, and the earth is only so far from the sun, so that we do not burn up or freeze. Uh, these are laws, and they're known. And they've been stable and steady ever since God made it. And all of that is rooted in the omnipotence of God. He holds it together. That's his providence. Another way we see the providence of God is in Ephesians 1.18. i got to hurry up. Uh, Ephesians 1, 18 through 21. Uh, let me start in verse 15. For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, uh, which exists among you and your love for all the saints, I, I do not cease giving thanks to you, giving thanks for you, excuse me, while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, will, may give to you the, the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the full knowledge of him. And he continues, here's what he's praying for, so that, you, so that you, the eyes of your heart, having been enlightened, will know, what does he want us to know? What is the hope of his calling? That's one. Another thing he wants us to know is what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? Oh, that's, that's another just stunning doctrine. Uh, and then verse 19, here's another thing that he wants you to know. What is the surpassing greatness of his power? He wants you to know about his power, Christian. But not just that he is powerful, but how does he explain it? The greatness of his power toward us who believe. Toward us who believe. 
Uh, he, he goes on. It, it's, it's just too good to be true almost, right? Uh, the greatness of his, surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of the might of his strength, again, his omnipotence, which he worked in Christ. So another way we see the omnipotence of God is in the resurrection, by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. So the resurrection, ascension, and glorification of Christ is a display of the omnipotent power of God. But he mentions that to speak to us Christians, and, say, and he says, that power is used for you, Christian. He uses his omnipotent power toward you. How stunning and humbling it is that God utilizes his omnipotence for the benefit of his people toward us who believe. For your good, for your sanctification, for your sustaining, uh, for your usefulness in his kingdom, for your glorification of Christ. God's omnipotent power is operating in your life for these things. Yes, he is. Uh, he has. There is providence with God. He is involved in not only creation, but our very lives. And I need to hurry. And I don't like going quickly on these kinds of things, but we must. Lastly, we see the exercise of the omnipotent power in redemption. So the first thing that we see is that God's power is seen in Christ and in his gospel. We see the power of God in Christ and his gospel. 1 Corinthians 1.24 But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Christ is the power of God. Romans 1.16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The power of God is seen in the gospel in that it saves lives. It saves souls from judgment. Not only this, but power to save. Number two, power to save. Matthew 19 speaks of the uh, rich young ruler and he, how he was unwilling to give up his riches and his wealth to follow Christ. And Jesus says, to the disciples in Matthew 19, it, I, truly I say to you, it's, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to en enter the kingdom of God. The disciples hear, heard this and they were astonished and said, then who can be saved? Aren't the rich the most favored of God? That's why they're rich, right? God favors them. Not so. They asked, well... If the rich person can't get saved, who can? Good question. God, and Christ's answer is, with people, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. We like to take that verse and just twist it and use it as a blank check for whatever we like in life. But he's speaking here of salvation. With people, it is impossible for a man to be saved or a woman to come to faith in Christ. But with God, all things, including the salvation of the sinner, is possible. Even the salvation of a rich man is possible. So God can make a camel squeeze through the eye of a needle. <laughs> and not only this, but Christian... There is great power in redemption in that there is power to keep. Power to keep. And this is sweet. Romans 8.30 says, the, These whom he predestined, he also called. These whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. 
So those who be predestined are the same who he glorified. Right? And it, there, nobody falls off the wagon in between. Philippians 1 6 says, I am confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. He started it, Christian, he's going to finish it. And it's not based on your power, but on his. Jude 24 and 25 says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. Notice that word, able. That's power. He who is omnipotently able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. God is able to keep you. And he will make you stand in his glory, spotless. Sometimes when you're in your sin, he'll do that whether you like it or not. Right? In that moment, I don't want to be with God right now. I love my sin. No, whether you like it or not, he'll get you there if you're really his. And praise God that though we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. With this understanding of omnipotence, as we close, brothers and sisters, what this produces in the hearts and the minds of God's people is worship, confidence, hope, Comfort and victory. A.W. Pink says, Because God is omnipotent, no problem can master him, no enemy defeat him, and no purpose of his can be withstood. And we join the psalmist in Psalm 18, 1 and 2, where he says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Rest in his omnipotent power, Christian. And if you don't know him this morning, run into his powerful arms or else face his omnipotent wrath. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry with you and you perish. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for revealing yourself in Scripture. Lord, you want us to know these things. You want us to know the, the, the height and depth and, and breadth of your glory. And God, the more that we study, the, the smaller we feel, the more that we get to know you, the, the, the less it seems that we do know you. Because you, you go beyond us. Oh God, I, I pray that you would give great confidence and comfort and even boldness, Lord, to your people. We serve a great God. There is nothing that you cannot do. And you will accomplish all your good pleasure. And Lord, it's done through us at times, especially the salvation of the sinner. There's nothing that you can't do like save a sinner. And Lord, what an honor that you would exercise that power, as it were, through us as we speak the gospel to those around us. Thank you, Lord, for this honor. Thank you for who you are. May we worship you all the more. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.